After Red Hood found himself kicked out of Gotham, he became an outlaw. This is the Red Hood outlaw storyline right here at the Full Story Channel for Comic Story. Now, it's in the middle of nowhere America, with Jason sitting on an empty bus as the bus driver tries to make small talk with him. Jason lets the man go for a bit, but then he tells him to stop. The bus driver says that he really doesn't have to be rude about it, and Jason points, is telling him, up ahead, someone's on the road. The bus comes to a screeching halt and Jason tells the bus driver to open up the door. The bus driver says that he can't. That would be an unauthorized stop and he could lose his job. Jason says that or you could lose your teeth. The door opens up and Jason steps out with an injured woman in the road telling Jason to get back on the bus. Her name is Special Agent Melissa Mitchell of the FBI and she's ordering him to leave. It is not safe for him to get involved. Jason leans down and picks Melissa up stating, yeah, I'm not leaving without you. Once he sets her down on the bus, the bus driver asks what happened to her. She tells them that her and her partner were dispatched to pick up a fugitive crime boss, except the boss had other plans. She barely escaped with her life, but her partner? She witnessed the execution of a federal agent. Just then, a light shines on the bus, and a group of bikers appear in the street. The leader of the group holds up a bottle of alcohol and a flare, shouting to the bus driver to send out the FBI agent, and no one gets hurt. They got one minute to respond. Jason gets back out of the bus telling them, that's good, that leaves us 45 seconds of free time. The biker asks, what do you reckon you're gonna do with that time? And Jason tells him, first, I'm gonna beat the crap out of your friends, and then I'm gonna shove that flare up your, well, <laughs> you get the idea. The biker shouts to the others to kill this punk, and just as he finishes, Jason kicks him in the face, taking the bottle and the flare. As the other bikers begin to run up, he lights the bottle, throwing it into the crowd, covering them in flames. More begin to show up, and as they charge in, Jason grabs one with his own chains, and then he throws him at the others. One man with a knife lunges in out of the fires, and as he goes to stab Jason, Jason steps out of the way, taking the knife, slamming it into the man's neck. The remaining men grab their guns and they open fire, but before anyone can hit Jason, Jason, he runs through stabbing one of the gunmen and taking his gun, killing the rest of them. With everyone dead, the leader of the group begins to scoot back, telling him, please don't kill me. Jason reaches down, grabbing the flare from the man's mouth that he shoved in and telling him, you have bad memory. I didn't say I was going to kill you. After making good on his promise, Jason gets back on the bus and Melissa asks, where is he going? He pulls out a mask from his bag and he says he's going to work. Melissa pulls her gun, telling him, she knows who he is. The mask changed, but he's still the same guy who tried to assassinate Cobblepot. You're under arrest. I can't let you walk out of here. As Jason finishes getting changed, he puts on his mask and he says, The only reason I'm even here is because me and a friend are tracking down a drug ring with ties to underlife. Your situation indicates to me that I'm on the right track. Besides, in your current shape, you're not stopping anything. Melissa tells him that he can't go. She's an officer of the law. And as Jason gets off the bus, he asks, how did the law work out for your partner? A short while later, down at the County Sheriff Department building, Sheriff Bradford tells the crime boss, LaCroix, to please be reasonable. He came up with a cover story, but before he can, they're going to need to get out of there before the FBI comes around looking for their dead agent. LaCroix says no. He and his men aren't going anywhere until they get the lady agent's carcass. Just then the lights go out, and Jason jumps through the window wielding a crowbar. One of the thugs begins to open fire where Jason landed, but then he stops when he sees. Nothing. Bradford grabs his flashlight and he calls out that he doesn't know who he is, but I'm the sheriff around these parts. Jason hits the sheriff in the throat, knocking him out, and LaCroix asks, Do you know who I am? I'm a part of Underlife. That makes me untouchable. Jason cracks LaCroix from behind, telling him, I just touched you. What does that make me? Using the crowbar, he beats down the men, killing them with it. As Bradford gets up, he runs to his desk, calling for help over the radio, but when he doesn't get an answer, he notices Jason standing there, holding the plug. Jason starts to walk forward, telling him, A week ago, I never even heard of Underlife. Now is the only thing that anyone is talking about, so tell me everything. Bradford cowers, begging Jason not to kill him. If he says anything, Underlife will kill him. And Jason tells him, Did I somehow give you the impression that I wouldn't kill you? Meanwhile, outside, the crow runs to one of the only patrol cars with keys, and when he turns on the lights, he sees Jason leaning against a wall. He plugs his ears, and the crow says, I don't get it. And then he looks down at the steering wheel, and he sees a note. Boom. Later that night at the hospital, Melissa turns off the news, and she asks if he's going to stand there all night, or actually turn himself in. Jason tells her neither. Here, this belonged to your partner. I figured you'd want it. He hands Melissa the badge to her partner and she says that his family will be very grateful. She's grateful. 
She then says that she's a little surprised that a Gotham crime boss would be so sentimental. Jason tells her that he recently lost two partners himself. Melissa tells him that this goes against every rule in the book, but she could use some of his expertise on this. Jason gets ready to leave through the window, telling her, Yeah, because that always works out. Believe me, the last thing that you need is this outlaw. The next night at the diner, a trucker sits at the bar telling Molly the waitress, Come on, give me your seven digits. I'll guess the area code. Molly says, like she said before, she's pretty sure that her boyfriend wouldn't like that, so he's going to have to settle for coffee. Jason sits next to the man, stating, Make it two. The trucker then asks if there's a reason that he's sitting there when there's open chairs to stretch out in. And Jason tells him that he's curious and he wanted to know if he can help him. He knows the truck out there is hauling three million in stolen medical supplies for underlife. But you're going south. What's south? Texas, New Mexico, south of the border? The trucker says, I'm afraid you're going to be scratching your head for a while. Jason tells him, or you could be spitting the answer out along with your teeth. The trucker laughs as he grabs his knife, but before he could pull it out, Jason breaks the sugar dispenser across the trucker's face. As the rest of the truckers get up, Jason knocks them all out one by one until he's punched in the face by a massive fist. He groans, telling the large man, Tiny, that he should get license plates for those fists. Tiny puts his fists together, telling him, We are a bunch of yokels. The underlife united us. We're a part of something bigger. Nowhere. But you? You're just a dead man walking. Just then, there's a quiet plink and Tiny falls to the ground. Jason looks back and he sees Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, standing there, out of costume. He gets up stating, If you're here to fight, can you give me a second? I gotta recover. Bruce tells him, I'm not here to fight. Sit. Bruce gives Jason a cup of coffee and Jason takes a sip, asking, Don't you think it's a little strange? If this is about taking me back to Gotham, it's not gonna happen. Shooting Penguin wasn't a crime, it was a public service. Bruce tells him, Actually, Cobblepot didn't die, so technically you didn't break our deal. But it sure wasn't for a lack of trying, Jason. Okay? So why are you here, Bruce? Bruce sips his drink, and after a moment of silence, he puts his hand on Jason's shoulder, telling him, Roy Harper is dead. I'm sorry. Jason holds his head, and he says, We just talked last week. He... How? Bruce goes on, telling him, We have a place called Sanctuary. And Jason repeats the line, Rehab for capes. He said. Bruce continues. We don't know who or why, but a lot of people were killed there. Trust me when I say that I won't rest until we find out who is responsible. Jason sighs. It's a lot of people that are going to be out for revenge. No one needs me getting into the mix. And Bruce tells him, I agree, but Alfred said it was important to let your feelings out. Seriously? Grief counseling from a guy who dresses like a bat? Death isn't the worst thing that can happen to a person. I would know. Am I going to grieve over him? Yeah. Absolutely. But everyone who has ever put a mask on is living on borrowed time. Roy would be upset if I spent the life that I have left moping around. Even though everyone has either run away or knocked out, Bruce leaves money on the table and he heads outside. Jason follows and Bruce asks, Is there somewhere you need to go? And Jason tells him, Actually, no. I just need fresh air. But Bruce, neither of them say a word. They just hug. And in the reflection, we can see Red Hood hugging Batman. Jason pulls back and he tells him, Thank you for coming out to tell me yourself. I know it wasn't easy since, you know, we hate each other. I never hated you, not for a single moment. I won't deny that maybe you need to get your ass kicked once in a while, but at the end of the day, I know we both have each other's backs. Later down the road, Jason takes out his phone to make one last call to Roy. He leaves a message and he says that he just heard what happened. This is exactly why he'll never try and get his head together. He just wanted to tell him that he may have been a mediocre archer, but you were the best friend I ever had, Roy. Next time we meet, I'm going to kick your butt for this whole dying crap, buddy. Jason hangs up his phone, then he hovers his thumb over the delete contact for Roy. The next morning, Jason finds himself walking through Appleton, home of the world's best cobbler. Everyone here is friendly, like the complete opposite of Gotham. There's just an all-around positive vibe coming out of this place. Heck, even the older couple running the inn are as sweet as pie. No pun intended. Jason steps out onto the porch thinking that it's a real shame that he's going to have to tear this place down brick by brick. As he looks out onto the town, there's someone else looking in on him. The next day, Jason watches the townspeople as they attend the Apple Days Fair. Jason tries to find something out of place when a woman walks up stating that she just sees someone with an empty mouth. He didn't come all this way to their humble little town to miss their world-famous apple pie, did he? Jason tells the woman that he appreciates it, but he's not really an apple pie kind of guy. But while he's talking, the woman says nonsense, stucking a fork full of pie in his mouth. He chews, stating, Okay. That's actually delicious. She laughs, telling him to enjoy his time in Appleton. He then notices the innkeepers at their cider booth, and they call Jason over for a drink. He takes a glass, stating that everyone here is so hospitable. 
He holds it up, and he sees the reflection of the old man grabbing a gun. The man opens fire with Jason kicking the booth, throwing both the woman and the man off balance. The woman grabs a knife, charging after Jason, and as the second man grabs onto him, holding him into place, he shifts his weight, throwing the man over his shoulder, having him stab a woman instead. Jason pulls the knife out of the man, stating that he's pretty sure the Chamber of Commerce isn't going to be thrilled to hear about this, and the old woman shouts that he's gonna die here. So Jason tells her, nah. He looks at the rest of the townspeople surrounding them and he tells them, you all have 10 seconds to walk away. He slowly begins to count, but even before 10 seconds could pass, Jason simply says, screw it. And he begins to fight the crowd back. Even though Jason can hold his own against most odds, a bat to the back and a hammer to his face can really put a dent on that record. After blacking out, he feels something tapping on his face. And when he wakes up, he finds himself on a cross. He looks at a person who's tapping him and he asks, do I know you? The giant Solomon Grundy looking zombie begins to laugh. The zombie reaches out grabbing Jason by the chest and he begins to squeeze down cracking and breaking his ribs. So he kicks him back and then he gets ready and he swings. He leans to his side stating that he really hopes this work and the zombie ends up punching through the cross, destroying it. The zombie then trips afterwards though and as he begins to get back up, Jason takes one of the broken poles stabbing it into the zombie's back. With the pole sticking out through his chest, the zombie laughs, and as it grabs Jason by the neck, it begins to crush him. He thinks to himself that he generally feels bad about this, but there's no way he's gonna let this happen. So he reaches down, grabbing his hands around the pole, and then he pulls up, ripping through the zombie's torso. As purple and green guts splatter everywhere, Jason falls down, stating that it's a lot grosser than he was expecting. He begins to spit up what fluids got into his mouth, and then he notices that these guts are actually wires. Well, at least the zombie wasn't a real zombie. However, before Jason could even ask, anything he feels like pitchfork poking at his back he looks back and batwoman tells him you're a long way from gotham and jason tells her you're not a long way from having your ass kicked jason grabs onto the end of the pitchfork pushing it onto the ground throwing some of the zombie guts into batwoman's face she yells at him that is so gross and kicks the pitchfork breaking it in half as jason tries to shield himself he tells her i didn't go back with him i'm sure as hell not going back with you and batwoman tells him that's that healthy jason todd ego the truth is we really don't have time for this crap. Jason looks back at the rest of the zombies coming their way and he asks, Why couldn't you just open with that? As Batwoman scans the area, she tells Jason that they know that these things are constructs, so they don't have to go easy on them. Jason takes the broken pitchfork, stabbing the handle through the throat of one of the zombies while running into help. But as he tries to jump away, one of the zombies grabs him by his jacket, throwing him across the field. Batwoman takes out a set of batarangs, throwing them into one of the zombies, but without Jason for support, she quickly gets captured. A few seconds later, the sound of a motorcycle can be heard, and Jason speeds by, throwing a pitchfork into the head of the zombie, holding Batwoman. As he lands, he says, I found another pitchfork. And Batwoman tells him, clearly, nice bike, by the way. He revs it up, asking, you coming or not? As the two of them begin to get away, Batwoman brings up a projection of the target mansion and asks, now are you agreeing with the plan? And Jason tells her, fine, let's just go. As he starts to walk, Batwoman stops him, stating that she just wanted to say she's sorry for his loss. She never really got Arsenal, but she did know that they were close. Jason tells her, I'm an asshat. But Roy, he was always too good for this world, deserved better. Batwoman then says that if he ever needs to talk, and Jason stops her stating, that will never happen, but thanks. As the two begin to take off, Batwoman says that she probably owes him another apology, you know, for getting you and your friends thrown in the Bell Reeve. And Jason shrugs it off, telling her, turns out it was all a part of Bizarro's master plan. It was just a role that you were assigned to play. She laughs, asking, so she was tricked into kicking his butt? That's a novel way of looking at it. Just then, one of the zombies lunges out, grabbing the bike from the back wheel, flipping it up into the air. Jason and Batwoman flip off of it, catching themselves, but as the first zombie breaks the bike in half, Jason grabs onto the chain that flies off of it. He jumps over the zombie, using the chain to cut off the head of the zombie, leaving Batwoman to deal with the rest of them. But before she could really attack, she's knocked back and Jason catches her. He says that he would feel guilty about leaving her, and Batwoman wipes her mouth, telling him that if he did stay, she would tear out his lungs through his nose. Go! As Batwoman gets up and runs back into the fight, Jason hurries on ahead, telling her, You're just so classy. He quickly makes his way to the mansion, but as he walks up, a group of assassins jump out and surround him. He says, Well, at least you're the saving the trouble of knocking. Meanwhile, inside of the mansion, a robot monitors the situation, telling his boss that there is nothing to worry about, ma'am. This place is fortified with the most high tech. Then there's a low whomp sound as the power goes out, and the woman in the shadows asks, You were saying... The robot tells her not to worry, the auxiliary power will kick in and they will be, but before he can finish the sentence, the doorway explodes, blasting him away. Jason walks through, stating, I think the robot was gonna say safe, but now I'm gonna go with damned. You took a whole town hostage and I'm here to liberate them. Oh, and you're the pie lady. 
The woman from before who fed Jason holds her hands to her hips, stating she is much worse than that. She controls underlife territory across three states. She is protected in ways that he cannot imagine. He sets down his gun, holding up C4, and he says, People keep saying that to me. Right up to the point before I kill them. The woman lunges forward, punching Jason, shouting that she is also holding the children of Appleton hostage. Kill her, and he will never find them. As Jason kicks her back, he says, Pfft. Batwoman already located them before she found you. And those punches? So not human. You are hitting way too hard. The woman throws Jason back, stating, Yeah, she's the latest model of constructs. She didn't birth the others. She's just a distributor. Jason asks, birth? And the woman jumps on him, stating that all of these people were created in a lab in New Mexico, a place called Herve El Agua. Jason uses the chain wrapped around his fist to swipe at the woman's face, yelling, I don't need an address, I need a name! As the woman picks herself up, she says that his name is Solitary, and she can die happy knowing that he is going straight to hell. Jason grabs his gun, stating, Yeah, see you there, pie lady! And a short while later, as Jason walks out of the mansion, Batwoman asks, How did it go? The mansion explodes behind him, and he tells her, You tell me. As the sun comes up, Batwoman brings all of the children hostages back to their families, and she leaves with Jason. Jason asks, Do you ever feel like we got it all wrong? She asks Elso. The bad guys. They're everywhere, even hidden in the middle of nowhere. They're always better financed and equipped. They either hire goon soldiers or apparently make robots now. Batwoman says, Look, we both have strayed from our original path. He forgave me. Show him that you can learn from your mistakes and he'll forgive you too. Jason tells her, You shot Clayface because it was the right thing to do. I shot Penguin because I was angry. There's no walking away from that. Just then a car honks the horn and Batwoman says that there she is. She jumps in telling Montoya to meet Jason Todd, professional drifter. Jason, meet Detective Renee Montoya. Montoya says to hop in anywhere she can drop him off and Jason says that he's heading south. As he gets in, Batwoman whispers and asks, No questions? And Montoya tells her, Please, I know better by now. Besides, I'm off till Friday, so south it is. Since the death of Roy Harper, Red Hood has been wandering and searching for answers. Answers about who killed Roy, but also answers on the one called Solitary. Shortly before Roy's death, he and Red Hood were investigating a drug trafficking ring that first led them to Beijing. That is what brought Red Hood to Mexico, or more specifically, Hervé Al Aqua. No one speaks of the abandoned prison. Even the locals are petrified just hearing the name. So the question is, what's everyone afraid of? Back in Appleton, the pie lady turned out to be someone called Monday. Just one in an army of clones serving the underlife boss known as Solitary. She claimed that he controlled a huge part of the country that isn't Gotham or Metropolis, which only makes you wonder why Red Hood hasn't ever heard of him. As Red Hood gets to his truck, he looks up, stating that he can see why this place has the locals spooked. This prison is more like a fortress, the one you're not supposed to go into. Red Hood opens up the metal doors and begins to look around, but one of the first things that he sees is blood splatter. By the looks of it, it was caused by a sword, a long one, and who would attack a prison with a sword? But after only getting a few feet within, Red Hood notices a small drone following him, and he thinks at least he's not alone. The next thing Red Hood sees is a giant door torn apart by what seems like an axe. Could a meta have done this? The only one that he can think of that could have done this is Artemis. He hasn't seen Artemis and Bizarro ever since Bizarro sucked the entire floating base that Red Hood, Artemis, and Bizarro had into a portal above Gotham. Just as Red Hood starts to head in, he's struck from behind by a man in a Bat Family costume. The Wingman costume, and the man tells him that he'll be honest. That went a lot easier than he thought. Red Hood reaches for his crowbar, stating that his mind was elsewhere. Just like that head is about to be! The man kicks Red Hood in the face, telling him, That's a good one! And a short while later, Red Hood wakes back up, stating, Not gonna happen, Wingman. No way some third-tier wannabe bat is gonna drag me back to Gotham. Wingman tells Red Hood that he's a little confused. He's here to beg him to come back under his own volition. He took Red Hood's old suit, the Wingman's suit, to show him that he was wanting him to return. There are interested parties who believe that he is needed. Not everyone agrees with Batman's methods in Gotham. They've been waiting a long time for a prince of crime to lead them out of the darkness. Red Hood then says, well, uh, that was unexpected. But why the getup? Why an old identity of mine? Before Wingman could answer, a brick is thrown, knocking Wingman out. With no one in sight, the bricks begin to move on their own from the wall, and they all aim straight for Red Hood. Red Hood braces himself, but 
the bricks pass through him and only damage the chair that he's in. Red Hood gets up to look out of the hole in the wall and he sees a floating arrow made of bricks pointing in a direction. Red Hood tells himself, very subtle. Not like I wasn't going to explore this place anyway. And as Red Hood follows the path, he finds a test tube with another clone inside. Batwoman called them Mondays when he worked with her because the clones were created by the stolen DNA of Solomon Grundy. Red Hood realizes that this is depressing, but the rest of these test tubes, they're terrifying. Just then he hears something and he points his sword at whatever made the noise and he sees a dog. Red Hood says that she's a cute one and he holds his hand out for the dog to sniff. She sniffs and wags her tail. And Red Hood tells her, good, now that we're friends, lead on. Just don't expect a name. I'm not very good with names, hence Red Hood. As the dog guides Red Hood through, she brings him to a room filled with the underlies tainted drugs, all packed neatly and ready for shipment. Red Hood picks up one of the packages stating, this is it, they did it. But why can't I shake the feeling that something bad is about to happen? The dog starts to bark at the shadows and Red Hood follows and that's when he finds some stolen Star Labs tech. When he looks up, Red Hood sees one more test tube, except it's not another clone. It's the metahuman bunker. Red Hood reaches for the emergency release and just before he can press the button, a man with three shifting heads appears. Son, Red Hood tells him, Right. I'm gonna go out on a limb and state that the three of you are solitary. Solitary holds his arms up stating, I knew we would meet again, but I always thought that I would come to find my son, the king of his own domain. Disappointed to say the least. Red Hood tells him, that's cute coming from someone who kidnapped a 19 year old metahuman for God only knows why. Or maybe you're scared. Red Hood throws his crowbar at Solitary and Solitary dodges it and shouts, ha, missed by a country mile. Red Hood then says he also missed what the crowbar was being thrown at because it looks a lot less like an experiment and more like a cage. You're scared to death of Bunker, and I'm about to find out why. The crowbar pierces through the glass of the test tube, releasing the water from within, and Solitary yells, you have no idea what power you just unleashed. You forced my hand, son. Bunker was supposed to be used to get a better control over the clones, and all of that will be sacrificed to just maintain Bunker. As Solitary runs to the controls, Red Hood tackles into Solitary and gets ready to punch, but the dog starts to bark elsewhere. Red Hood looks up and sees Solitary standing across the room, and he says that he controls perception. He could be standing on his throat, and no one would be able to tell the difference. He's called Solitary because only his vision matters. His word is law. Red Hood gets up running away, telling him, Unfortunately for you, I'm an outlaw, so your word doesn't mean crap. Solitary begins to lift the bricks up, asking where is he going? And Red Hood says, just out of the line of fire. As the bricks shoot through the air, they hit the test tube containing Bunker. And Bunker steps out shouting, ah, how long have I been in there? The last thing I remember was a psionic disturbance. Solitary begins to escape stating, it would have been you. You were a threat to everything that has been built. But before Bunker could follow, Solitary begins to get away and Red Hood stops him telling him, hey, I need a favor. A few moments later, Red Hood tracks down Solitary alone with the dog. And just as he turns the corner, Wingman jumps out. Red Hood quickly ducks, grabbing onto Wingman, throwing him into a wall, stating, I'm going back to Gotham on my terms. Wingman punches back, telling him, that's not good enough. We need you now. Red Hood takes the crowbar, cracking into Wingman's arm. The Wingman spins back, slamming Red Hood into the wall, telling him, I will drag you back if I have to. The dog bites into Wingman's leg, causing him to let go, and the ground suddenly begins to shake. Wingman asks, what's going on? And Red Hood tells him, that is the work of my friend leveling this hellhole. You could be a part of the solution or a part of the problem, but you can't be both. Red Hood begins to run off and Wingman gets up stating, that did not go as well as I'd like. Why couldn't you just be honest with me? Red Hood follows the dog as he searches for solitary until he finds him sitting in a cell alone. Red Hood asks, are you okay? And solitary says, didn't want it to end this way, Jason. Before Red Hood could ask, everything changes around him and he places the two of them outside of the prison. Red Hood tells him, ah, right, perceptions. And Solitary tells him, yes, this is what I looked like years ago, normal. I was a prisoner locked up for a crime I didn't commit. I wasn't blameless, but in this case, I was unjustly accused. I spent my life writing and trying to reach out to my family. And then the government made me an offer. Red Hood looks at the images of three men strapped onto tables and he says, yeah, the government would experiment on you in exchange for your freedom, right? But just as they were starting, there was a massacre ordered by a man named Lex Luthor. He wanted his stolen technology back. He sent in a woman to make a statement and her name was Artemis. She had depths of compassion few will ever know. The process merged me and the two other inmates into one being. Solitary. I was given this power for a reason, and now together are father and son, and we can rebuild the empire, Jason. If that's so, 
Show me the tattoo. It was something you were proud of. Solitary says he must be mistaken, but Red Hood rips off the sleeve to Solitary's shirt, and Solitary backs away, standing he doesn't understand. The ground shakes and Solitary falls, and just as Red Hood begins to reach for him, the dog barks in the other direction. Red Hood whips back, throwing the crowbar into Solitary's chest, and he begins to escape. Solitary calls out to him, but Red Hood tells him, you hurt a lot of people. No one's gonna care if you die on the dirt floor of an abandoned Mexican prison. Solitary coughs. <coughs> You can't talk to your father that way. A week later, in a cemetery outside of Seattle, Red Hood visits the grave of Roy, telling him that he never said this before, but he always hated that hat. That trucker hat that he wore? He's not sure who did this and he doesn't even care. All he knows is that this has to stop. Never again, buddy. Never again. Bunker asks him, where to next? Red Hood tells him, Gotham City. But I'm gonna need you to go on ahead and set the tables. Bunker then asks, what about you? And Red Hood responds, I have a few things I need to take care of first. Gotham City. Despite everything people read in the news, the city is not the scariest, most dangerous place in the world. Okay, maybe it is, but it's more than that. They have a wonderful nightlife, despite all the PSAs about their astoundingly high crime rate. Tourists flock by the millions annually. Sure, there are some places that are a little less Friendly, but see, five miles offshore, they can have nice things. This place is called the Iceberg Lounge. A place where no one is discriminated against. The rich, the poor alike, are both welcome to lose everything at the Berg. And right now, it's under new management. The floating casino now is watched over by none other than Jason Todd. Why would he ever take over a casino? Because he wants to do his part in cleaning up the city. Susie Sue, well, she was brought in to help keep things under control when some of the patrons decided to uh, break the rules. And it's not just her. The rest of the sisters Sue are here. Blanc runs the books. Candy was eager to join the wait staff. Anastasia performs on stage. At night, well, she doesn't trust anyone. Great dealer. Then there's Wingman. Literally, he's Wingman. Probably a long story, but no one's bothered to ask him it. But it's not all fun and games, especially when members of the Falcone family have just lost a considerable amount of money. They yell at the dealer, stating that the game is fixed, and if they don't get their money back, they're gonna melt the place down. Jason smiles, telling them that he certainly hopes they don't. What can he do for them to make this the most unforgettable night of their lives? Because he'll do anything. Well, how about for starters, Miguel here brings them to their exclusive igloo suite while they look into this egregious charge. Bunker, out of costume, tells the three that if they would, they could follow him to the suite. The three follow Miguel upstairs, and then he bows as he opens the door to the most luxurious room in the lounge. The Falcones look around, stating that this is it. They're finally getting what they deserve. Miguel tells them that he is certain no one will argue that. That's when the bricks start to pull out of the ground and they form a circular prison, trapping all three of them inside. As the ball falls into the waters below, Jason asks Bunker if he's sure that it'll stay airtight all the way back to the docks. He shrugs, telling him, probably, hopefully. Later in the evening, Jason heads back to his office to go over Susie's report when suddenly there's a blinding light that shines through the window and bangs on the door. Dog runs over and starts barking, so Jason tells her to come back and get away from the door. He's pretty sure he knows what's coming next. Jason watches as the bat jet flies by and Susie opens the door with Batman charging in, punching her into the ground, knocking her out. Jason calmly drinks his champagne, asking, Uh, should I pour another? You are out of your mind if you think you're gonna get another attempt at playing the bad guy. Jason tells him, Haha, you got it all wrong. Penguin disappeared all on his own. Batman yells, If anyone else would have told me that, I would have believed it. But instead of staying out of Gotham, you've returned. That was a big mistake, Jason. As Batman steps forward, Jason holds up his wrist, telling him, All right, take me in. Batman pauses at the willingness of Jason to come forward. But Jason continues, Oh, wait, that's right. It was Red Hood who shot Oswald Cobblepot in the face. Certainly there would be a perfectly reasonable explanation why Batman's bringing in one of his foster sons to the Gotham City Police. Batman pauses. Jason asks him, What's the matter? Forgot your bat cuffs? See if they can convict me. Send me to Arkham. Wouldn't it be a riot if I wound up in the Joker's old cell? Batman grits his teeth as he turns away, jumping out the window. Jason tells him, Stop by any time, Dad. He then shuts the balcony door, thinking to himself that he wasn't really lying. Penguin did run. He just ran into an impenetrable panic room right over here in the Berg. 
and he's locked inside of it now. Jason pours himself another glass of champagne, raising it up to the fish tank behind him. And on the other side, Penguin beats on the glass, with Jason going on, stating, It's sad that I can't see the Penguin through this one-way illusion of depth. Can't even see a thing. But I do take solace knowing that Penguin will see his empire crumbling before him, and there's not a damn thing he can do about it. Meanwhile, in the thousand acres of all, a white-haired woman is holding a sword walking through the swampy marsh, stating, I know you're here. I've always known. And a voice calls back to the woman, stating, What do you want, Essence? Essence tells the floating sage that they need to talk, mother. They need to talk about the mistake that she must long last rectify. They need to talk about Jason Todd. Mother floats for a moment in silence and then says, Damn. Elsewhere in Gotham, at Gutter's Fine Fish Products Factory, a butcher is whistling while he throws the next batch of fish into the grinder. A lanky shadow opens the door, telling the butcher that they are needed. The butcher that asks, have they been summoned by the penguin? And the shadow says, worse, we haven't heard from him in a week and we have to find out why. Back over at the lounge, Jason walks through the game floor when he notices a blonde woman at the bar staring back at him. She waves, stating that he probably doesn't remember her, but her name is Isabel. They used to date a while back. While Jason goes to rekindle an old flame, there's an explosion that shakes the entire casino. Everyone begins to run away from the smoke, but through it, five men step through and the shadowy man from before tells the others that their boss went off the grid a week ago. Which means the five aces have been activated. We have to find Penguin. But just as the five men are about ready to move out, the lanky man asks, What the hell are you looking at? Susie, along with the other sisters, tell them that the sister Sue are here to kick their butts and toss them overboard as poorly dressed shark food. Take them down, girls, hard and fast! A brawl erupts as the five sisters begin fighting. They notice the leader of the group disappears. Elsewhere in the casino, Jason tries to lead Isabel to safety when they're suddenly shot at. She tells them, Look, if you need to kill this guy, but before she could finish, a layer of bricks forms shielding them from the gunfire. She asks where the hell did the wall come from, and Bunker walks up holding a briefcase, telling them, that would be me. But if you could follow me, our insurance premiums would skyrocket if you were wounded or killed on the property. As Jason takes the briefcase, he opens it and he smiles, telling him, damn, you really are good. Seconds later, he bursts through the wall of bricks and lands, telling the leader that he's pretty far from the thousand acres of all. The man throws some guns, asking, how did you? And Jason finishes telling him, Know you're all cast? I can smell the lot of you from a mile away. The man draws a sword, stating, I've heard of you. Others have spoke of you. You were the chosen one. Jason lunges at the man, telling him, Damn straight I am! Now that sucks for you! Moments later, Susie runs into the game room, shouting and asking if Jason is in there. Jason stands in front of a smoldering pile of ash, taking his mask off, telling her, Yeah, I'm here. Susie then says they cleaned up the four aces, but one got away and they aren't sure where he went. So Jason takes a drink and tells him, I'm not sure. Just be glad all our people came out okay. I'll get maintenance to take care of, uh, this mess. But before in another plane of existence, Jason picks himself up, battered and bruised, staring at an unimaginable horror. He tells the giant creature before him that he has two choices. Let the kids go now or be killed. Or free the kids and be killed. The creature opens up its gaping mouth, asking if Duca chose to send a child after him. The devourer of young souls? She has lost none of her humor over the millennia. Jason holds out a glowing sword, stating that she didn't choose him. She just knew better than to try and stop him. The creature laughs, asking, Is that the all blade in the hands of a human? How the all cast has fallen. You expect me to cower and fear over a single weapon? Jason smiles, telling him that the all blade is the physical manifestation of one's soul. As you can see from all the swords, clearly I have a lot of soul. He then wakes up in a fountain. The old woman, Dukra, tells him that he is welcome to stay among them. He'll always have a home in the Allcast. Jason says someday he'll return. After Batman and the Joker's heads hang from matching pikes in the center of Gotham City. Meanwhile, in current day Gotham City, Bunker gets to work with the repairs in the casino, heading into Jason's office to get something. Penguin bangs on the glass, shouting, asking, Why did I insist on a soundproof room? As he sighs, he hits his head against the glass, and Bunker stops and looks back. Over in the thousand acres of all, Essence sits before a fire and calls out. Essence, the first daughter of the Allcast, summons you from the grand beyond. The fire flares up and an image of the Ace's leader appears and he shouts that he must be avenged. Essence tells him that he lost the right to be avenged when he walked away from them. She compels him now to tell her the last thing he saw before dying at the hands of Jason Todd. The man says he saw Jason's eyes and there was nothing there. The one who once walked among them, he is gone. Essence waves her hand, dispersing the man's specter, stating, And now, so are you. Meanwhile, over in Paris, Jason walks into a perfume store, and he tells the cashier that she would like to live 
leave. She runs out of the store, so Jason kicks in the back door, stating, You made a good choice. He grabs the guard standing on the other side of the door, several people sitting at the table, then shout at him, asking, What is going on here? The woman at the head of the table stands up, shouting, Euro Blanc has no time to waste dealing with the hired assassin, Red Hood. One of the men calls out that they were summoned here by the new owner of the Iceberg Lounge, Jason Todd. And Jason tells them, You got it all wrong. Todd works for me. He's the public face that handles the business interests. I didn't call together the five biggest crime families in all of Europe for nothing. Another man asks, Then you would be able to tell us what became of Cobblepot then. Jason tells him, Look, if I knew where Penguin was, I'd give him up in a heartbeat. He hit a mountain of expenses when Jason took over the lounge. Probably the same reason he left town in the middle of the night, like a coward. Another man calls out that it was not Penguin's establishment to sell. They have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into the Iceberg Lounge to keep their money clean. Jason tells him, yeah, about that. That's why I called you all here. I'm not in the laundering business. Too bad for you. Laser sights all begin to target Jason, and another man says that he's going to call the casino to have them wire all their money back. If not, he will not leave here alive. Just then, Jason's phone rings, so he grabs it, telling them, uh, hang on, give me a second to dump this call. He hits the button and Wingman appears and tells him that he just wanted to give him a status report on the situation up top. In short, they're locked and loaded. Give the word and the international board meeting becomes a smorgasbord. Lasers start to drop off one by one and Jason asks, Are you done? Smart. Ladies and gentlemen, it was an absolute pleasure not doing business with you. Back at the Iceberg Lounge, Penguin is snoring as he sleeps against the glass. But he hears a sudden knock. He opens his eye and Bunker asks, Senor Cobblepot. A moment of your time. Later, as Jason returns to the city, Wingman drives Jason to the docks, asking if everything's okay. He says, I guess, Wing. And Wingman tells him that he's been meaning to ask him about that. First, they were at each other's throats, but he saw past that. He even hooked him up with a job. All this time, he's never really asked his real name. How do you know you can trust me, Jason? Jason tells him, I like to keep things simple. Betray me and I'm gonna kill you. Wingman tells him that that is, uh, fair. As Jason hops on his boat to head to the casino, he looks at his costume, stating that after Artemis and Bizarro, you think he'd learned his lesson. All these people around him now, they're growing on him. But just then, the mist swirls around the boat and Jason sighs, taking off his coat, stating, Ha ha! There she is! She wants to stop me. Fat chance of that happening. The all-cast is a warrior cult dedicated to protecting humanity from an unspeakable evil. Jason suits up and says, They don't usually like to get involved with anything besides the untitled. I should be honored, Essence. Essence appears before him, stating that it's not something that he should be making a swell of pride with. She knows what he's planning to do, and she's here to stop it. She reaches up for Jason's mask, stating that she's not sure whether to kiss him or kill him. But his smile, it's gone. He tells her, well, yeah, we're a long way from the thousand acres of all. He goes on asking, what did Dukra think of this? And Essence says that she had to be convinced. She really doesn't want to hurt him. So Jason puts back on his mask, telling her, I'm not really worried. Just then his surroundings change, and Essence takes him to another plane of existence, thinking to himself that he is the only human to be trained by the Allcast. Essence was the only heir to the throne that she ever wanted. It was never going to work between them. She thinks fighting on this astral plane was going to throw Jason off his game, but she couldn't be more wrong. She kicks Jason back, and Jason tells her, Okay, maybe I'm a little rusty. She tells him that her mother was wrong to take him in to teach him their ways. So he charges forward, swinging his sword, stating, Maybe not. Maybe she just saw more in me. Essence knocks him back, telling him that he broke her mother's heart when he left. He broke her heart as well. She lunges with Jason knocking her back, stating, Stay down, please! But she jumps into the air, shouting, Never! She showers Jason with energy bolts, and he tells himself that it worked. He took a risk to make her angry. Now let's hope he lives through to collect on it. He falls to the ground with Essence sword in his chest, stating, that when they started their training, he took the All Blades. She chose the Blood Blade. She yells that she can slay evil and carry it forever in her blade. He has no idea what she is feeling having to kill him. And he laughs, stating, <laughs> Don't feel too bad. Just then her body is sucked into the Blood Blade and she asks, What is the meaning of this? Once she is trapped within the sword, he pulls it out of his chest, stating, The All Blade is a manifestation of what passes for his soul. The Blood Blade became a sacred trust to never draw the blood of an innocence or be trapped within it forever. He looks at the sword, stating that she made the same mistake everyone else does. Jason Todd, the Red Hood. He's not evil or good. He's just practical as hell. Later, he staggers into his office, placing the blood blade into a safe, and then he hears a click. He looks back to see the penguin sitting on his desk with a gun pointed at him, stating, Wah! 
Jason slowly raises his hand, stating that he's kind of surprised this didn't happen sooner. Penguin grips the gun, stating that he has one question before he shoots. Why get involved in something so suicidal? What does the Red Hood have over you? Jason pauses for a second and asks, You don't remember? Penguin says, I got shot in the eye, kid. There's a lot I don't remember. Plus, I was at the grand opening of the ice patch when I woke up in a hospital missing an eye. Jason lowers his hand, stating, I was a hired hand by Red Hood. He's the one who owns the place now. Just then, Penguin gets ready to pull the trigger, and Dog jumps up, biting Penguin, causing him to miss the shot. Jason runs over, taking the gun from the Penguin, and the Penguin asks, You can't really believe that I'm afraid of you! Jason tells him, No, not me, but Red Hood had a meeting with Euro Blanc a few days ago. They're eager to talk to you about the money that they were laundering through the casino. Penguin jumps to his feet, shouting, Out of the way! I'm ruined! Everything I've worked for! Just then, the wall bursts open, his bunker shouts for him to stomp. Penguin jumps up, cheering, That's it, Miguel! Nail this crap to the wall! Bunker tells him, just a moment, and he forms a wall around both him and Jason. Jason asks, were you the one that let him out of his cage? And Bunker tells him, absolutely. When I first came to work for you, I believed in you. I believed in you until I found that the previous owner was being held hostage, starving, filthy, and dehydrated. Jason shouts, asking, do you even know what the Penguin does? How many families he's ruined? Can't you tell the difference between me and a homicidal maniac? Bunker lowers the brick, stating, I thought I could. As Bunker breaks through the window and the penguin escapes, Wingman flies down, stating that he can get the wing ship in the air and blast him out of the water. Jason tells him no. Penguin is wanted by an international cabal five times larger than his own organization. Everything came together in the end. Wingman takes off his helmet, stating, Wait, you never planned on killing him? Jason tells him, No, I just wasn't going to let him off that easy. I just needed him off the table while the game was reset. Taking away everything that the penguin cared about was my goal. Seconds later, Susie bursts in asking what the hell happened, and Jason tells her, Yeah, you're gonna want to get a broom or a mop for this. So she punches Jason in the arm, stating, You had me confused with a maid. Jason then says, Not at all. As the owner of the Iceberg Lounge, you're gonna need to take some pride in this place. After a few moments of silence pass, Susie says, You're serious. She hugs him, stating that she never wanted a life of crime for her sisters. and She just gave them a second chance running this place. Later, as Wingman drives Jason back to the docks, looks up at the city, stating that he can sit here and marvel at the view all night. It looks majestic, like she could hold you. Jason tells him, Yeah, but she's a liar. No matter how much faith you put in her, Gotham will always let you down. No matter how much of yourself you give, it's never enough, is it? He jumps off the boat and Wingman says that he's more than he'll ever know. He always has been. He takes off his coat and he touches the Batman tattoo in his arm, stating that he couldn't be more proud of his Prince of Gotham. And for those of you who don't know what that means, Jason stated earlier when he thought he met his father that his father had a Batman tattoo in his arm to remind him of Batman. And when he thought he had met his father, he discovered it wasn't his father when he was missing the tattoo. So the tattoo in his arm implies that Wingman was his father. But anyway, a short while back in the city, Jason gets ready to leave town when a small Brainiac drone stops before him in the middle of the road. An image of Lex Luthor appears, and Jason asks what could he possibly want from someone like him. Lex Luthor tells him that he comes with an opportunity. He learned everything about a so-called hero under the mentorship of Batman, and still he died. He became a villain pretending to be a hero, and then a hero pretending to be a villain. There's a new generation that could use the talents of one named Red Hood, and he could learn from the experience. He's offering Red Hood the chance to get it right where Batman got it wrong. Jason sits up on his bike. All right, I'm listening, Lex. Robin has created a black ops prison where he's keeping prisoners in what he is calling the proper way to handle them. He doesn't agree with Batman's plan to put them into Arkham Asylum. So his plan was to create his own prison beneath the base where the Teen Titans work, but then tell none of them that this even exists. And he's dealing with that right now. He's also been getting his information as to where to get these individuals from Red Hood, but it seems like Red Hood may have betrayed them, leading us to today's story. The Teen Titans, well, Robin versus Red Hood. Deep below Mercy Hall, the current headquarters of the Teen Titans, there's a smile that comes across Robin's face. This prison that he built, it's dark, it's cold, it smells. Everything a real prison could ever hope to be. But it must remain a secret. Not many could even stomach what it takes to succeed, except for the one person that has learned his secret. Prior to this, Robin led the team on a covert mission to obtain something within the Batcave itself. Roundhouse steps into the giant halls asking if this is really the Batcave. Also, the Batcave is real? Kid Flash tells him, hold up, why are we here? 
And Robin tells him because they're gonna steal from Batman. My source has been compromised. It's clear the others reach in the criminal underworld may be wider than anticipated. If we're going to fight this, we're gonna have to level the playing field and take Batman's most powerful tool, information. Robin then tells Roundhouse that they're going to need full backdoor access to Batman's computers. While they work on that, he has something else to deal with. Roundhouse begins to get to work, but while everyone crowds around the computer, Crush looks around noticing Jin is missing. Just then an alarm goes off and Red Arrow asks, what did he do? Roundhouse asks, would you believe me if I told you nothing? Meanwhile, upstairs, Robin passes a portrait of Thomas and Martha Wayne with Alfred stating that he remembers the day that they set for that painting. Welcome home, Master Damien. You should know Master Bruce spends many a sleepless night thinking of you and your well-being. Robin pulls up his hood stating, that man barely sleeps anyway. But as he walks away, Alfred stops him stating, you shouldn't take things that don't belong to you. Robin starts to state, I didn't. And Alfred stops him telling him, I also don't appreciate someone going through my things. I cannot allow you to leave with what you took. Robin asks, why are you protecting him? And Alfred tells him, because Jason is your brother. I'm going to do for him what I would do for any of you. Just then the alarms reach the main floor and Robin says, it sounds like you're needed down in the back cave. Alfred sighs telling him, oh, Master Damien, it's being handled. Down in the cave, Roundhouse says, I got good news, I stopped the alarm. Should be smooth sailing from here on out. But that's when from above them, Batman leaps out of the shadows. Back upstairs, Robin tells Alfred to move. Red Hood betrayed me. I'm just doing what father should have done a long time ago. Alfred tells him, Jason's methods may be unorthodox, but he is a part of his family and on the side of good. Do not presume malice in what is perhaps a miscommunication. Talk to him. Do not make rash decisions that you may regret later. Robin leaves walking down the hall to the Batcave, passing all of the portraits of everyone. When he looks up at the painting of Bruce and all the others, he scoffs, continuing on his way. But behind him, Jin is watching from afar. Down below, Kid Flash runs through the cave, yelling to Batman, You know us! Stop this! Something's not right here! Over by the giant penny, Roundhouse is hiding, praying to God that if he survives, he will limit himself to only playing two, maybe three hours of Fortnite a night if they make it out of here. Batman starts to walk closer when Robin jumps through, cutting off Batman's head. Roundhouse screams as Batman's head bounces on the floor, but then everyone notices the circuitry hanging from the neck. Roundhouse shouts, asking what just happened, and Robin tells him, it's a rare case where Batman wasn't here. There are security measures in place. But when everyone gets ready to leave, Red Arrow asks Jin where she's been the whole time. She thinks about it for a moment and says that she must be mistaken. I was here the whole time, Red Arrow. Back in the current time, our current day, Robin hears his name being called out. And in that moment of not paying attention, Black Mask reaches towards Robin with a makeshift ship. A Red Arrow shoots past him and into Black Mask's hand, and Red Arrow says that she thought they were in this together. That mission they went on, that was a distraction, wasn't it? What were you really doing there? Why keep me in the dark? Robin picks up the shiv, telling her, It was, uh, family business. Red Arrow then says that she knew working with Red Hood was a bad idea. He was the one who tipped them off about Gordon, but the other knew they were coming when they went for Lady Vic. So Robin tells her, I know, trusting Red Hood was an error in my judgment. Red Hood is in league with the other. And Red Arrow says that, or he is the other. As the two head back up to the loft, Robin takes out a small box stating that their mission was to retrieve this. And with it, Red Hood will no longer be a problem. Later that night, Robin follows a stumbling Jason Todd out of a bar. He didn't want to confront him like this, but things need to be taken care of. He sits on a stool next to Red Hood and he tells him, You look like crap. And Red Hood asks, Are you even old enough to be in here, Damien? Robin laughs, stating that the law states that minors can be in businesses that serve alcohol as long as they are accompanied by an adult. So that's you. And we need to talk. Red Hood grabs his beer, telling him, No, we don't. Besides, you're already too late. The old man already found me. Told me what happened to Sanctuary. Red Hood then pulls out a dart and lines up his throw, stating, You better find out who killed Roy, or I will. The dart is thrown, and Red Hood says, I was very clear how this works, Damien. You come to me, not the other way around. And Robin tells him, We have a situation. Lady Vic is dead. The other killed Vic before my team could get her. They blew up the whole building with us inside. We barely got out alive. Red Hood asks, Is everyone okay? And Robin tells him, Yeah, but perhaps you were expecting otherwise? Hoped maybe we would all die? Red Hood then asks, what are you talking about? And Robin tells him, someone knew we were coming, and I know who, it was you. Robin whips his arm back with the dart stabbing into Red Hood's leg. And Red Hood shouts, asking, are you crazy or something? A second later, Robin is thrown out of the bar, and as he gets up, he quickly changes into his costume with Red Hood storming out, yelling, what the hell do you think you're doing? Robin jumps up, throwing Batarang, telling him, I know it was a setup. Nobody knew we were trying to stop Lady Vic other than you. You're the one who gave us the mission. Robin starts swinging, but Red Hood catches his arm, stating, 
Don't do this! Robin then jumps onto Red Hood's back, ripping off his mask, stating, I am going to take you down for good! After an electrically charged hit to the face, Red Hood falls. Robin tells him, Say it! Say you're working with the other! You've got enough of your own sins. You're not going to get me to confess to something I didn't do! Robin then asks, You want to keep playing games? Okay, let's play. He then takes out the small box that he got from the mansion. Red Hood looks up at it, stating, What's in there is my business. It's bigger than this whole crusade. Even Batman wouldn't stoop this low. Robin tells him, Say the truth! Now! Red Hood tells him, You want the truth? Now I'm pissed! He smacks the box out of Robin's hand, and as Robin tries to run for it, Red Hood grabs him by the cape, flinging him into a truck. He takes out both his fists, cracking Robin in the back, telling him, I would ditch the cape if I were you! Robin laughs, stating that he's done taking lessons from him. And Red Hood picks him up by the hair, punching him, telling him, Next time, you need to check your facts. You always think you're the smartest one in the room. And there's some truth to that, but you're still just a kid with a lot to learn. Red Hood then finishes with a knee to the face, and as Robin falls, he tells him, Consider this one final lesson. Don't start a fight you can't finish. Robin leans up, opening his vest, showing a bomb, shouting, Even if I lose, I'm gonna win! Red Hood stares up for a moment, and then he smiles. Nice bluff. We've both been dead once before, but you lost the minute you showed up. I'm not working for the other. In time, you'll understand that. But from here on out, if you and your team come looking, I will put you all into the ground. As Red Hood picks up the box, he leaves. And elsewhere, the other watches. Even later that night at Mercy Hall, Robin tosses in his bed groaning with Jin asking what's wrong. He tells her nothing, and Jin says that she's here to help him. He needs to be honest with himself. So he gets up stating that he just misjudged something, that's all. And Jin tells him, ah, I can see it now. You're feeling sorry for yourself. Robin spins back shouting, I am not! But in doing so, it causes him enough pain to fall to his knees. She kneels beside him, telling him that she can heal his physical wounds, but he needs to let her in. The body and the soul are more connected than he might realize. This requires trust. He swats her hand away, stating, trust is a commodity I can't afford. I would expect you to understand that more than anyone on this team. She places her hand on his shoulder, telling him that he withholds from the team for the greater good. But his wounds are severe enough that they require attention, either from her magic or a physician's hand. So what are his barriers worth to him? Will he maintain them at the cost of his life? He shuffles in the bed, stating that he'll be fine, he just needs rest. As he sits on the bed, Jin says that he had absolute power with her ring and he chose to return it to her. She trusts him. If she heals him, he will need to trust her. That is why she will share with him one of her own secrets, her greatest shame. 4,000 years ago, there was a tale that angels were created from light, and Jin was created from smokeless fire. Her brothers existed before man walked to this earth, but she was born in a time of humanity. She is Scylla, a female Jin, rare amongst her kind. Shrines were built to her, sacrifices made in her name. It wouldn't be long before she drew the attention of the eldest of them, the most powerful Jin there is, and ever was. His name was Elias and he was the most beautiful thing that she had ever seen. He opened her eyes to the truth of all things, but the Creator made them to be subjugated to the will of humanity, to a life of servitude, not gods, but slaves. Elias taught them that they could fight back, and they did. They fought against those wishing to control them. Eventually, their mission took them to Maka, the mother of all cities. They were there to retrieve the infamous Stone of Souls. It was a stone that was said to have descended from heaven itself. As they prepared for the fight of their lives, they found the stone's protectors were mere children. She refused to kill them, and Elias grew angry. He questioned her loyalty to him and their kind. So she turned and used her magic to stop him, and her other brothers fled with the stone. She cast a protective spell upon the children, but for betraying Elias, she would be punished. Instead of killing her, he did something far worse. He took her ring and made it into a prison. He then commanded her to kill every one of the last children she tried to protect. But her punishment had only begun. He never stopped looking for the stone, and over the thousands of years, he lended her ring to other masters who might help him achieve his goal. But a year ago, the unexpected happened. A young boy stole the ring from his master and gave her back her freedom. Since then, she's had to hide her powers in fear that Elias would come back. Jin looks at Robin and asks, Do you hate me for knowing my secret? He tells her that he's not really in a position to judge. She isn't the only one who's done things that will follow them forever. He's hurt people too, taken lives. But he's always had a choice. She can't blame herself. He then takes off his mask, telling her that she isn't alone. My name is Damien Wayne. And Jin says that it's nice to meet him. As the two begin to get closer to kiss, there's a beep coming from Robin's mask. He looks at the visor, and an image of Deathstroke comes on the lens. Jin asks what's the matter. And the words, Deathstroke escapes Arkham, begin to flash. So he puts on the visor, stating, Everything.
As Jason Todd walks through a park, he holsters his gun and he puts back on the hood, stating, Hey, buddy, you got a second? The young boy, Vessel, sings on the swing set, telling him, Sure, anything for you, sir. So Jason kneels down and he says that he knows about his ability to sync with the dead, to use their superpowers, and he needs him to do it right now. Vessel stops swinging and he tells him that he really doesn't want to. Sometimes it hurts. Jason leans in, stating that he really wasn't asking. Either Artemis or Bizarro. Can you find them? So Vessel's body begins to shake and Jason reaches for his gun. But then Vessel stops. He tells him, nope, nothing. Sorry, Mr. Hood. So Jason tells him, no, it's fine. You did good. Let's go or you'll be late for class. Vessel hops off the swing, stating, but I have good news though. It didn't hurt that time. It's getting easier to do. And as the two walk out of the tranquility program, Jason knows that this actually is a good thing. The fact that Vessel can't commune with the ghosts of Artemis and Bizarro means that somewhere out there, they're alive. Now let's go back in time a bit. Six months to be exact. We're gonna see exactly what happened to the ones known as Artemis and Bizarro. After jumping through the quantum doorway in an attempt to, to save Bizarro as he was mentally digressing, the two found themselves in a strange and faraway land. One where the Hall of Justice was in ruins and it was labeled the Hall of Punishment. Bizarro looks up at all the spikes sticking out of the building and he asks, We am going in? And Artemis tells him, We certainly am. But off in the distance, there are two people watching, known as the Dairy King and Air Quote. Dairy King takes a puff of his cigar, lowering his binoculars. It looks like they've got themselves some capes. One of them, they're superheroes that were supposed to save the world. Call the reinforcements, stat. The young girl next to him lifts her hand up, and as she makes the call, she says, yeah, hostiles. Yeah, I'll hold. As Artemis and Bizarro walk into the hall, Bizarro sets his hand on fire with laser vision. Artemis asks him, doesn't that hurt? And Bizarro asks, does what hurt? Artemis sighs, not even bothering to follow up the question, and then stops Bizarro from moving any further. In front of them stands the shadowy figures of the Justice League. And Bizarro asks, Why am nobody happy to see us? Artemis tells him that it's not the Justice League, but their statues. They've been destroyed. Someone is trying to tell them something. Just then a voice calls out, Excuse me, but the museum is closed for the evening. You're not supposed to be here. The two turn back to see a security guard holding a flashlight and Bizarro quickly freezes up his hand. The guard then asks, how did you just do that? Unless you are capes, bona fide capes. The light chuckle, the guard says, <laughs> I'll show you around a bit since you don't seem to know where you are. Truth is, I haven't seen a real live cape since Hero Day. Artemis asks, what is Hero Day? The guard leads them to a large door stating that it was the day the whole world fell apart. The day that mere mortals had to get themselves back on track one hero at a time. The massive doors open and Artemis and Bizarro see Superman's body, his head crushed under the weight of the Daily Planet antenna. Artemis grabs his sword looking back at the guard, stating that he's gonna tell her exactly what happened. The guard says, could have been Lex Luthor, Brainiac, hell, a mishap at Star Labs. The thing is, no one really knows. All we know is that the bomb went off, something genetic, like a switch that had been flipped. Every metahuman on Earth had their powers just turned off. And nearly every ordinary human wound up with a superpower. Some got one of each, some got all. Apparently you lured it over people long enough. Some people are eager to settle the score. Suddenly the ice covering the guard's fist begins to crack and spikes like what's covering the Hall of Punishment shoot out. Artemis calls upon her axe, but it doesn't come. And instead she feels as if her very essence is being ripped from her. Mazara catches her asking, you am okay? Me think mostly, where am mistress? Artemis tells him that she doesn't know. She summoned her, but she's not here too far too. Bizarro tells her, Now a bad time to sleep, Red! As Bizarro sets Artemis down, spikes shoot out from the ground, impaling Bizarro. He screams in pain and then looks back, stating, You did this! The security guard, now covered in spikes, says, Yeah, and I'll confess, I sure do enjoy putting capes like you in your place. I didn't do it alone, though. Many of us rose up, thousands of us. Without your so-called powers, you were nothing. Soon the spikes begin to crack and Bizarro walks out telling him, power does not make you something, but sure am helps. Say goodbye, jerkhead. Seconds later, the security guard can be seen flying through space and into the sun. Bizarro dusts off his hands with Artemis getting back up, stating that she normally wouldn't condone such an act. But as he put it, he was certain a jerkhead. But they can't stay here. They need to go and get a lay of the land. There could be hundreds of superpower vigilantes, maybe millions. And Bizarro then says, or lots. 
Outside, a group of super-powered humans patrol the area while Artemis and Mazzara watch from afar. Mazzara asks, Can we just kill them first? Red her? And she says that she's thinking. But that's when a voice tells her that thinking is the highest cause of death around these parts. The two look back to see a slender man, somewhat looking like the Joker, who says that his name is Knife, Jack Knife. Now stay and be slaughtered by a never-ending wave of super-powered norms, or join the resistance and live to fight another day. So six months later, around the time frame of Red Hood's current adventures, a superpowered human named Flutterby flies through the city telling herself just a little further. But soon her wings of fire fade and she crashes down into the pile of bricks. A voice tells her that she gave it her best shot, but she chose the wrong side in the meta-biological conflagration. She was one of them, but instead she turned coat and chose to die with a bunch of genetic dead ends. Flutterby smiles and says that she supposes that's one way of looking at it, Kennel. Kennel stares for a second in his suit of armor made out of a car, and then says, Wait, why are you smiling? A second later, a bearded Bizarro bursts out of the ground, punching a hole in the suit, shouting, Me and why? Me and Bizarro! People smile when me around! Kennel falls out of the suit of armor, and Flutterby jumps up shouting to end him. But Bizarro stops her, telling her, No, Red Him said not to kill, so Bizarro not kill. Mostly. You have the jewel thing we needed? Flutterby hands over the small green jewel, and Bizarro walks away looking at it, stating, Me am walking away, in case you want to do more for good. In which Flutterby flies up and sets Kennel on fire. Meanwhile, over in the Pentagon, Jackknife holds his hands out of the cell, stating that all it took was one bomb and everything changed. Artemis' voice asks if he really thinks that she is seriously listening to him. Artemis, now having one side of her head shaved, leans against the cell wall. When two guards walk up telling her to step back, she knows the drill. She turns her back to them, holding her hands out, stating, yeah, yeah. Yet every time that she does it, she's told they tase her anyway. The other guard says, not this time, but as he tases her, he laughs, shouting, just kidding! She groans as she starts to get back up, stating that they have six seconds before the recharge. Can he do it? So Jackknife jumps over her, stating, Absa positively lootly, your royalness! He kicks both men in the necks, knocking them out, but as he jumps down on one of them, ready to kill, Artemis grabs him by the tie, stating that they don't have time for this. The two make their way through the halls of the Pentagon, and as they enter in the monitor room, a man stops them, stating, Welcome. He knows who they are and what their pathetic resistance is trying to do, and it ends here. They may call him General Samuel Lane. Artemis tells him that they have decimated his forces over the past few months. What makes him think that he can really defeat them? Lane asks, in a word, reinforcements. Apparently, there is an opening between here and another universe through a quantum wormhole of sorts, which means that they'll have an entirely new Earth from which they can call metas while making normal people more plentiful in the process. The screen lights up with images of Artemis and Bizarro's home world, and Jackknife asks, That's where you came from, huh? Artemis then asks, How do you plan on delivering your genetic bomb? Lane says, Admittedly, I do not know. But another voice says, But for me, it's child's play. A moment later, a giant brain with a face comes rolling up, and Artemis says, Lex. A hologram of Lex's face appears, and he asks, Have we met? And Artemis says, To her eternal shame, she used to work for him in another reality. Jackknife then says that that's Lex! He's the guy behind Hero Day? And Artemis says, Was there ever really any doubt? But why would you think that you can send a bomb across the universe? The brain turns around and slowly wheels away, and Lex says, quite easily. As you can see, this quantum doorway that I have found and repaired can allow me access to the multiverse. No other individual but myself could have fixed this. Jackknife looks up to see the fragmented quantum doorway put together, and he asks, should they be scared of a glowing block of wood? What am I missing here? Artemis thinks to herself, stating that she cannot let Lex have this. She must. But as Artemis jumps into the air, Lex electrocutes both Artemis and Jackknife, stating that they're pathetic creatures. Quietly, she says, now be. Lex asks, be what? Just then the shadow of a man appears and Bizarro jumps through with other members of the resistance shouting, Outlaws! Outlaw! As Jackknife grabs the genetic bomb from one of the guards, he tosses it to Bizarro. And the shadow then grabs onto Lane shouting that you may have destroyed our base of operations, but you cannot kill the brains behind our plan. Artemis tells him that he would be surprised. She comes down slashing through Lex's giant brain and the hologram begins to fade. Bizarro holds up the small jewel from before the bomb and says, done. So Jackknife then takes the bomb and says that this should reverse everyone's genetic alterations, even if most of the original heroes are dead. But maybe it'll be better that way with no one having powers. Artemis takes Bizarro by the hand and tells him that heroes and outlaws are wherever you least expect to find them. You realize that there's no way to know if this is actually going to work if your door is going to bring us back to our original world. And Bizarro says, Me know where Red Her is. 
Bizarro will be. And with that, the two jump through the quantum door and hopefully they're returning home. And there's another full story right here at the Comic Story and Full Story channel. This is a channel where we just re-upload some of our underperforming ones from the other channel to appease the algorithm and see if we have a channel that only does full stories, how that would affect things. I hope you guys enjoyed it, but don't forget you can get up-to-date brand new videos by joining the main channel, Comic Story. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.